The ladies' devotional has been changed to Monday the 15th at the home of Martha Jones, and there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Let's continue to... speaking where your word speaks and being silent where it's silent. May we have the courage to teach the good things that you give to us, but to recognize that there are things that are negative in your sight and help us to avoid those. Lord, we thank you for our country. And we realize that we are in turmoil in this country. Help us, Father, to recognize the principles that we believe you gave to us. And help us to implement those, to follow those, and to learn the necessity of being kind one to another, being unified, and following the principles, and especially those that you give to us in your word. There are many enemies of the cross of Christ, many enemies of our country. Among them, Islam, and Father, we pray for those people that we might be able to reach them and turn them to Jesus and away from all the cruelness and unkindnesses that they practice. And Father, we're so thankful that we have one another in this 
And we pray that our love will abound one for another. We pray for the families that grieve, and we ask your blessings to be upon them. And Father, as we enter into this period of worship, help us to free our minds and hearts of everything that would stand in the way of our worshiping you in spirit and truth. We love you, Lord. We know you love us. Guide us today. Use us always to glorify you. And save us, we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. Number 266. 266. We'll sing the first. Hey, Clyde Huckabee. Hey, can you grab, turn the back screen on for me back here? Sing the first and last stanzas. <clears throat> Let us sing. Wonderful story of love. Tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love. Waking mortal strength. Angels with rapture announcing. Shepherds with wonder receiving. Sinner, I want you to be Nay, hard now to the cross, 
They are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and loss, Jesus went to the cross. But he carried my sins with him there. He is tender and loving and patient with me while he cleanses my heart of his straws. But there's no condemnation. I know I am free, for my sins are all held to the cross. They are nailed to the cross. They are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and loss, Jesus went to the cross. But he carried my sins with him there. I will cling to my Savior and never depart. I will joyfully journey each day. With a song on my lips, and a song in my heart that my sins have been taken away. They are nailed to the cross. They are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and loss, Jesus went to the cross, but he carried my sin with him there. As we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, let us remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us, offering up his life on the cross and shedding his blood for each and every one of us. This time, let's give thanks for the bread. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your love. We're so thankful for Jesus' love and for the great sacrifice that he made for each and every one of us. And Father, we remember that sacrifice as if we partake of the bread, we remember his body nailed to that cross, that he willingly gave up his life for us, that we might be redeemed back to thee. We pray, Father, that we'll partake of this bread in a worthy manner, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.
Let us give thanks for the cup. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this cup that represents the blood of Jesus shed that faithful day on the cross. And we pray, Father, as we partake of this cup, that we will remember Jesus. And we'll be thankful, Father, for the blood that washes us clean from our sins. Remembering that Jesus loved us enough to offer up his life. We pray, Father, that we'll examine our hearts, that we'll partake of it in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, this time we have an opportunity to participate in another part of our worship and giving back to the Lord part of what he's blessed us with. Let's give thanks for the offering. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for each and every blessing that we enjoy in this life. Those spiritual blessings that we enjoy in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and those physical blessings that sustain us day by day in this life. Father, we're thankful that we have this opportunity that we can give back to Thee a portion of that which You've blessed us with. We pray, Father, for our elders and our deacons who have the oversight over these funds that they'll be used wisely to spread the gospel and to relieve the needy and bring glory to Your name. We pray, Father, You'll continue to bless this church, bless our efforts, help us to reach those that need the gospel, Father. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
If you would, please stand and let's all sing number 488. 488 will be our song for our lesson this morning. We'll sing the first and last stanzas. <clears throat> Let us sing. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song. The tolls that bind me, it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing so. Showers of great blessing or my heart will flow. Sing to me, hope heaven, let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the heat Fall. Sing to me, hop heaven, sweetest song of all. Sing to me, hop heaven, tenderly and low, till the shadows o'er me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, sing to me, hop heaven, sing that old sweet song. Sing to me, hope, hope, and let me fondly dream of its golden glory, of its pearly gleam. Sing to me when shadows of the evening fall. Sing to me, hope, hope, and sweetest song of all. You may be seated. If you'd like to mark in your song books, number 514, 514 will be our song of invitation this morning. Good morning. Good morning. I need to brag on us, on you. Many of our church family have been thinking about praying about Charles and Gail, and as you know already, our brother Charles passed and stepped into eternity this week, and the church family really stepped up to provide for this family during their time of grief. They had a large family, in fact, probably somewhere in upwards of 50 folks who were here Bruce told me yesterday that he received phone call after phone call from members of the congregation who said, Bruce, do you have enough food? And he said, well, I think so. And they said, well, let me fix this anyway. I don't know if it's ever occurred to us, but in a large family like that, I think it would be safe to say there are probably a number of folks who have never set foot in a church building associated with the Lord's church. And all they know about us is what they see and experience. And they saw a number of ladies who were willing to sacrifice their time to prepare a delicious meal. They saw folks who were willing to serve that meal and to provide for them during this time of their broken heart. And I wanna commend the Oxford church family for your devotion and for your love. I realize at the introduction this morning that I'm probably talking initially more to men because some of the ladies will say, what's the difference? But what's the difference Stay with me. What's the difference between a bullet and a shotgun shell? Well, anybody associated with firearms and ammunition would know essentially a bullet shoots one projectile, while a shotgun shell shoots a lot of little bitty projectiles at one time. Typically, a rifle shell is shot at a stationary target while a shotgun is at a moving target. 
I have in my preaching career made the mistake of shooting shotgun shells from the pulpit. And by that I mean I scatter a whole lot of ideas into the assembly and hope that something will hit those targets. And when folks shake me out or I shake them out of the building, there will be people who will say, thank you for that sermon, but if I were to ask them what to talk about, they probably can't and couldn't remember because there were so many different ideas. I'm not going to shoot one bullet, but I'm gonna shoot three. And I'm going to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1st and 2nd Thessalonians this morning because there are three things that I want to do in the next minutes that we have together. There will be a textual bullet as we will study briefly 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and that will serve as the foundation for what I will say in the balance of the lesson. There will be a practical bullet as we make some observations based upon that text for our life to consider today. And as we often pray the Lord that we can take it with us during the week. And then there'll be an experiential bullet where I say, I'm going to help train us, teach us to do what we've studied thus far, three bullets. Number one, if you're with me in your Bible, you need to be aware of the fact that the church at Thessalonica, like all congregations of God's people, had various challenges. There were two challenges facing those Christians at that time. Number one, there was, I'm sorry, there was moral laxity in the congregation. And that needed to be dealt with. Society had invaded the body of Christ and there were members of the church who were not living faithfully to their vows to Jesus nor to one another. But there was also an issue of false teaching and false teachers. I'm going to ask you to turn with me to 2 Thessalonians. And I want you to notice... Verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, to give you the background of what they're facing. Beginning at verse 1, Paul said, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, watch it, there are false teachers who have sent false messages, false prophecies, coming in under the guise of being apostles, and they're telling error about the second coming. There were those members of the church in the first century who were of the conviction that the coming of Christ, believe it or not, had already occurred. And somehow their loved ones had missed out on some things. Or if it hadn't occurred, it was going to occur, and somehow their loved ones who had died would miss out. And watch what he says here. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you. Now, watch verse 2, because this is the heart of what's facing this church. Not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled. Now, watch it. Either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. He said, don't, don't, get, don't get upset, don't get shaken. Yes, you've heard false teaching. Yes, you've heard this, but it's not true. These sources are not legitimate. Now back up with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And you get some of the context of what this congregation of God's people are facing. Now, here's the consequence. There are people who are coming in under the guise of being inspired apostles or sending letters as though they're an apostle. And they said the second coming's already occurred. And folks are upset. They're tore up. And there are a number of problems associated with false teaching. I might just make this observation. You cannot believe wrong and live right. Mm-hmm. 
And so here is what occurs. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 20, he says, Do not despise prophecies. Now, you have to ask, why would he make that statement? Well, false teachers have come in and they've prophesied and the congregation has gotten burned and they say, you know what? We're not going to listen to them. In fact, we're not going to listen to any prophecies. Then Paul said, now, wait a minute. Don't overreact. Don't let the, the pendulum go to the opposite extreme. Yes, that is error, but don't let it go to the opposite extreme. He said, don't despise prophecies. Now, there in the margin of your Bible, if you don't underscore the word despise, it literally means this. It means to make of no account. Now, I don't hear this a lot in in Alabama parlance, but when I was being raised in Tennessee as a boy, I'd often hear people talk about something being of no account. It's a no account dog. He won't hunt. Or a no-account car, it won't run. Or a no-account man, he's not faithful to his wife. And Paul said, watch this. Don't despise all prophecy. Don't say all prophecy is of no account. Don't disesteem it. But now watch what he says. Here's the proper biblical response. He said, test all things hold fast what is good now i want to talk about this word t-e-s-t test circle it in your bible the word test in the old king james is sometimes translated prove the american standard version for example uses that word the word means to prove to test to examine to scrutinize with the with the goal of trying to prove the authenticity of now listen to the word again he said don't say prophecy is of no account all prophecy because that's obviously not the case because a prophet is one who speaks for and divine prophecy is on behalf of or the speaking on behalf of god and so he says this He says, no, rather than despising everything, test everything, scrutinize it, examine it, test it, investigate it. Now, the word in the Greek was used in ancient times of the testing of coins. In 650 B.C. approximately, on the eastern shore of the Aegean Sea, and when I say eastern shore, think of Greece, Coins were invented, and with the creation of coins as a monetary system, there were two things that came about as the result. There were counterfeiters and counterfeit coins. And there was such a proliferation of of counterfeits, well, even before that, let me talk about counterfeiting. There were two ways to counterfeit an ancient coin. Number one, they would take a, a, a metal, they would take a metal disc, and they would cover it with a very thin veneer of precious metal, a very thin veneer. And, and in other words, they would we, we would say they'd spray paint it. And then they would dye, they would cast it into a dye so that there is the appropriate insignia on each side of that that disc now on the inside it is simply an alloy it is cheap metal but it has the appearance on the outside of a legitimate coin it was referred to as a foray a foray is the french word it means it means to stuff Stuffing. Think of stuffing a turkey. Well, on the inside of the coin, it was cheap alloy, but on the outside of the coin, it was actually a very thin veneer of gold or silver. That was one way to do it. The second way was to take a clay mold, and what an artisan would do is he would make this clay mold of an actual coin, and then he would copy the mold. 
infinitely because they were cheap to make and they would inject those molds with a cheap alloy, a shiny alloy, and they'd break the mold and then they would use that as spending money. And so there were two ways to counterfeit. And what's happening in ancient societies is they would be overwhelmed with counterfeit coins. And so, uh, for example, the Athenians did this. They would set up tables at the marketplace for the bankers, and if they suspected perhaps that the coins were not legitimate, that they weren't authentic, here's what they would do, is they would pass a law providing for an individual whose sole job was to be a coin tester. And he would do three things. Number one, he would scrutinize the coin. He would study the coin very carefully to see if it looked right. Secondly, he would place it on a scale in comparison to another coin that was legitimate to see if the weight was right. And then thirdly, they didn't have scissors, but what they did have is they had a chisel and they would cut into the coin itself to see what was on the inside. And if the weight was right, if the outside was right, if the inside was right, they would say, well, that's legitimate. If, on the other hand, they cut the coin and they found out it was an alloy, they said, this man is a counterfeiter and he would pay the consequences. Now, hear and listen to what the Apostle Paul said. He said, do not despise prophecy. Don't say it's of no account. Don't go to the point that all preaching or all teaching is illegitimate. On the other hand, he said, rather than despising all things, test all things. Now, what was true then is our mandate today in the body of Christ in 2019. I want to make some observations. This is bullet number two. I was listening to Melvin last week, and if you are not with us, and perhaps out of town for the holidays, let me encourage you to go on YouTube and you can listen to his Bible class as he talked about the legacy that we're leaving our children. And then he did two lessons, a.m. and p.m., on the mission of the Lord's church. And he said a few things that really convicted me that I wrote, and I've talked with Melvin since then, and I've asked for permission to repeat some of what he said, and he's granted that to me. He made an observation here, and I want you to hear the Spirit. He said, it is possible, stay with me, prove all things, test all things. He said, it is possible to have a mission program in the Lord's church and not to be mission-minded. And then he quoted a series of passages. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Do it by the authority of the Godhead. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Teaching them. And he asked this question to us all. Melvin said, Jesus was a man on a mission because he had received a commission from his father. And he asked this question. He said, do we, as members of the body of Christ, as blood-bought Christians, do we, as members of the body of Christ, does Jesus expect us to use our tongues and our voices and our lips and our thinking to lead people to Jesus Christ? That is the only plan Jesus has for saving the world. That's the only plan. With that having been said, there, there's a couple of observations that, that I want to make and that you're probably thinking, possibly thinking. Number one, there may be somebody who is thinking, you know what, Mike, I... I I've heard those verses quoted, I can quote them myself, but I can't teach. 
may I respectfully say you don't give yourself enough credit. Can you teach somebody to start and raise a garden? Can you teach somebody how to clean a rifle or a pistol? Can you teach somebody how to work in the yard or how to prepare and fix a pie? See, if we can teach how to do the mundane things in life, we can teach people to do the very thing that we did ourselves when we obeyed the gospel. Amen? Amen? Someone says, Mike, well, I'm not comfortable with that. I, I understand that. But the issue is not comfortability. I can hear a few people thinking, Mike, I am an introvert. Surely Jesus doesn't expect me as an introvert. And, and, and I'm not con condemning introverts because the truth be told, your preacher is an introvert. I always have been. I'm uncomfortable. But the fundamental question is this. Do we have the individual personal mandate to tell other people about what Jesus did for us? Because they're lost in their sin. And the obvious answer is, yes, we do. Now, here's what we've done with 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. Peter says, sanctify the Lord to God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense. And we said, okay, here's what it is. Always be ready, always be ready to give a defense. But you know what? Nobody has ever asked me about my Christianity. Nobody has ever asked me about why. But look at it in its context with other verses of Scripture. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Listen to me carefully. I love us, church. I love you. But if we think a nice building is going to draw people, we've, mis we've made a mistake. If we think Mike Benson is the drawing power to bring people to Christ, we've made a mistake. If we think friendship alone is the way to lead people to Christ, we've made a mistake. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. The one thing that leads people, saves people's souls, is the message of Jesus Christ, that he died on my behalf, and he is the only way that I can be saved, and we individually have the mandate. We have the responsibility. We can send men and money to Curacao and still not be mission-minded. Our job when we talk to our friends and loved ones is not to win an argument. Our job is to look for and plant seeds of truth in honest heart soil. And the one thing that really stuck out in my mind about Melvin's sermon last week was this. Did you hear him at the beginning of his sermon? He said, I was reading the Bible before I met Janiah, but she led me to Christ. You know what he was saying? He was saying he had the heart soil. He just needed somebody to lead him to the truth, to do what was right, to be baptized. Surely in this congregation of 120, 130 people, we all know somebody with good heart soil who needs to hear the gospel. Now remember, remember, Paul said, don't despise all prophecy. That's bullet number one. Test all things. Is that legitimate? Is that true? Is that just a veneer? Is that a false teaching or is that the truth? Now, 
as we think about our individual mandate that we'll all one day stand before Almighty God and God will say, did you obey the gospel? And to give you or troubled, rest with this, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and there will be people who stand at the judgment day, and they'll look at us and they'll say, wait a minute, did you know the gospel? Yes. Did you obey the gospel? Yes. Why didn't you share that gospel with me? Well, I'm an introvert. And he'll be lost. And we'll stand before that very same God, and God will say, did you have the gospel? Yes. Did you obey the gospel? Yes. Why did you, why'd you not share that? And we'll be held accountable. I want to do one thing. This is bullet number three. I'm going to ask you to turn with me now, bullet number three, to Acts chapter 10. Because number one, we have the mandate to test all things. It's a command. It is not sufficient simply to say, well, the Bible says, we're to prove it. Number two, we all have not only the opportunity, but number two, the obligation to share the gospel. Now, here's what I want you to do. In Acts chapter 10, have your pen handy. Here's the question. Here's the bullet. And let's see if we can't tie it all together. We're shooting at the same target. You know as well as I, and there are some here in the assembly who know this first person. You've been taught, you've been told that baptism is not essential. It's not necessary to be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you be saved. Let's prove that. Let's test that. Let's put that on the scale. Let's put that on the scale. And here's what I want to give us this morning. I'm going to give us one chapter, one chapter. And if you can read, yes, even as an introvert, if you can read the word of God with a friend, if you can read the word of God with a loved one, can you sit down and say, sweetheart, tonight, let's read Acts chapter 10 together. And let's just see the power of God is not in the building. The power of God is not in the preacher. The power of God is in the word of Jesus Christ. Let's read the word of Christ together and show them what happened there. And if they can read and if they have an honest heart, you can lead them to Christ. Just like Janiah led Melvin to Christ. Begin reading with me in Acts chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. There's a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. Cornelius. He is a centurion. A centurion means he's over a hundred men of what was called the Italian cohort. I want you to notice something here. Verse 2, he is a devout man, one who feared God with all of his household. Number one, he is devout. Number two, he fears God. Number three, he gives alms generously to the people. Number four, he prays to God. I want to ask you a question. What is his character? How many people do you know with that kind of a heart? He's devout, he fears God, he gives generously, and he prays. By the way, go over to verse 22. Cornelius, a centurion, a just man, one who fears God, has a good reputation among the Jews. How many people do you know like that today? Did he, as a good, moral man, still need to be saved? About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly a vision, an angel of God. A vision as opposed to a dream. I'm asleep and I see it. Well, a vision is something he experiences during the day. He's awake. And here's the vision. An angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, and when he observed him, he was afraid. And he said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up before a memorial before God. You have caught God's attention. You are devoted. By the way, he's not a Jew, and so he's not under the law of Moses. 
Verse 5, stay with me. Now, send men to Joppa. All we're doing is just reading. It's the only bullet that we're doing here. We're just reading one chapter of the Bible together. Verse 5, send men to Joppa. Send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. The angel said in the vision, Cornelius, go get Peter. Simon Peter, who's staying at Simon the Tanner's house. Verse 6. Now watch it. He is lodging with Simon a Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Now underscore this phrase. Got your Bible with you? He will tell you what you M-U-S-T must do. Cornelius Peter is going to tell you what you must do do could he be saved on his own goodness shake your head this way no he could not peter's going to tell you now beginning at verse 9 the next day as they went on their journey they drew near the city peter went up to the housetop to pray sixth hour he became very hungry he wanted to eat but while uh, they made ready he fell into a trance and he saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound on four corners Peter's in a trance. Peter is hungry. He sees this great sheet come down, and it's full of all kinds of four-footed beasts and animals. Now watch what happens. Verse 11. Descending to him, let down to the earth all kinds of um, animals, beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him saying, Peter, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, no, Lord. This is the Mike Benson version. Verse 14. I cannot eat pork chops. I cannot eat bacon. I cannot eat catfish. Why is that? Those are unclean. I've never, Peter never had a piece of bacon. He never had pork roast before. He said, I can't eat that. That's unclean under the law of Moses. Voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times and the object was taken up in heaven. Peter has a trance. He's gone up to pray. He's hungry, and while he's hungry, he sees the sheet. Rise, kill, and eat. Peter said, I can't eat it. Verse 17, Peter wondered within himself what this vision meant. Behold, men who had been sent from Cornelius, they checked for him. So Peter's going to go with these men back to Cornelius. Begin reading with me at verse 24. Come on, church, we're going to shoot a bullet here. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and his close friends. Cornelius has had a communique from an angel of God, send for Peter. He will tell you what you must do. Cornelius gets his whole family together because an angel has spoken to me. And I want everybody to know what Peter's going to tell us that we must do. The man who is about to be evangelized is evangelizing. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. By the way, Catholicism says this. Catholicism says there are two heads of the church. There's the head in heaven and the head on earth who is the pope. And they would say Peter is the first pope. How do I know that's not the case? Because, verse 26, Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. You know what he's saying? I put my blue jeans on one leg at a time, like everybody else. I'm just a man. I'm an apostle, but I'm just a man. I'm certainly not the Pope. And so Peter rehearsed what happened to him. Cornelius rehearses what had happened to him. Drop down to verse 30. Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, Behold, a man stood before me. By the way, man here, an angel earlier in the chapter. What's an angel look like? A man. Verse 32, send therefore to Joppa, call for Simon. Verse 32, when he comes, he'll speak to you. But now remember more specifically, back earlier into verse 6, he, Peter, will tell you, Cornelius, what you must do. Verse 33, So I sent to you immediately, you have done well to come, now therefore we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Now watch the light go on for two people here. 
verse 34, Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. In truth I perceive. You know what Peter said? Oh, oh, I realize the sheet coming down, the, the, the sheet's full of four-footed beasts, that was God's way of saying, this is not, I can take the gospel to a Gentile, to Cornelius, which he is doing right here. But now I want you to notice something. Verse 6, he's going to tell you what you must, you're obligated to do. Here is a good moral man who is still lost in his sin. And verse 35, in every nation, whoever fears him, well, we already know he's a God fear, and works, righteousness is accepted by him. Hold your finger here, please, and turn back with me to Psalm 119. Briefly and quickly. Psalm 119, and look at verse 172. The psalmist said, my tongue shall speak of your word for all, some versions say S-U-M, not S-O-M-E, for all, for all your commandments are righteousness. Now watch it, in every nation, whoever, whoever fears God and works righteousness, well, all of your commands are righteous. Cornelius said, we're here to do what you tell us to do because I, I, I must do something. And I want you to notice the first thing that Peter does. He begins at verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The first thing that Peter did is he preached Jesus. Verse 43, all we're doing is shooting a bullet. All we're doing is shooting a bullet. All we're doing is reading the Bible with a friend. Verse 43, all we're doing is reading the Bible with an honest and good heart. Verse 43, Peter said to him, Jesus, all the prophets, witness, all the prophets are talking about Jesus, that through his name, that is by the authority of Jesus, Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. And someone says, aha, there it is, preacher. There it is, Mike. The Bible says, all that you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Really? Let me ask you a question. Would God send a conflicting, confusing message? See, God's not the author of confusion. God cannot lie. You remember the Lord's Supper, the very first one in Matthew chapter 26? Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And he says, Observe, take, eat this bread for For well, this is my blood, listen, of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of sins. Now, tie verse 6. You'll be told what you must do. Verse 35. Fear him and work righteousness. Well, what's working righteousness? It's obeying his commands. Well, what's a command? To believe in him and you'll receive the remission of sins. But don't stop at verse 43 because the Bible doesn't stop there. Now watch what happens. Peter is still speaking, verse 44. Stay with me now, Oxford. Peter is still speaking. The Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word, the Gentiles. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. Those who would have been circumcised, the Jews, because... Just as eight years or ten years earlier, people on the day of Pentecost began to speak in tongues and languages which they had never studied before, that happens here on the Gentiles. 
that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. What God is saying here in the sheet, as well as in the speaking of tongues, is that the Gentiles have the opportunity to obey the gospel just like the Jews did. Now watch what happened. For they heard them speak, verse 46, with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Verse 48. Now watch it. You've got to tie 48 to 43 to 35 to 6. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Well, in the name of the Lord is through his name to verse 43. I can read Acts chapter 10, you can read Acts chapter 10, and you can lead an individual to Jesus Christ and show them that they must believe, that they must work righteousness, that they have to be baptized in order to receive remission of sins. What have we done? We've proved it. We've tested it. We've examined it. I'm going to do something. I've never done at Oxford this morning. And if you're in a hurry, I'm going to disappoint you. If you're worried about getting out and eating a meal, I respectfully, lovingly say, I'm not here. You did not bring Mike Benson here to do his 30-minute bit and sit down. Either we believe what the Bible says or we're going through the motions. Either we believe what the Bible says or we're going through the motions. See, we all have the mandate to prove and to test what the Bible has to say. We recognize, hopefully, that all of us have that mandate, whoever we are, to use our skills and our abilities and our talents and our relationships to lead people to Jesus Christ because we live in a lost and a dying world and we're all going to stand before Almighty God at the judgment day and either say we obeyed the gospel and we shared the gospel. If we didn't obey the gospel, we'll be lost. If we don't share the gospel, we'll be lost. Are you willing to make a commitment this morning to share the gospel where you are? To do nothing but just say, can you read? Can we read together? I'm scared to death because my, my concern, my concern is, is that people are going to say, no, nope, look at Mike, he's ingratiating himself. He's, he's patting himself in the back. A poor, broken man came to this office six weeks and four days ago and just said, I need a little bit of compassion. I need some food. I've spent the night in jail. And I said, how are you going to get those groceries home? Well, I'm going to carry them, I guess. And I, I, I took that individual home. And I said, you know, tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to have Bible study. I'd love to get to know you. I'd love to study the Bible. And he came to the Oxford Church. And the very first person he met was Keith Luker. And Keith walked up to him and wrapped his arms around him and said, I'm glad you're here. And Terry said, I will never forget that because somebody showed me compassion. And he came back Sunday. And you started shaking his hand. And a few of you started giving me money to help him. And a few of you took him out to eat. And a few of you encouraged him further. Four weeks to the day, to the day he responded to the gospel. The past three weeks he's been on the Lord's table. Because we showed him some compassion. Because the preacher Two elders and a deacon taught him the gospel. 
in lesson after lesson after lesson. And all we did, and all we did, is sit down with Terry Kohlenberg and read the Bible together. Now, if we as a congregation can share a meal, and we can give a stranger a hug, and we can help put clothes on his back, and we can share with him the gospel, why can't we, why mustn't, why must we not do the same thing again and again and again and again? We keep waiting and saying, well, we, we need a different preacher. I've heard it before. My, my feelings aren't hurt. Well, we, we need a different building. Well, we need different circumstances. No, we need hearts that say the world is lost and the only people that will lead them to Christ is us because we have access to the gospel and Jesus has saved us. Let's prove it. Let's test it. Let's love them like we've loved Terry. Will you make that commitment this morning as Clay leads us in the song, elder, deacon, wife, woman, Teenager, will you make the commitment this morning that you're going to lead somebody to Christ? Clay's going to lead us. If you're not a Christian this morning, you know how to be saved because we've read it together in Acts chapter 10. I love you. I love you. But if you haven't obeyed the gospel and the Lord comes today, you'll lose your soul. And we don't want that to happen. Will you make that commitment? Will you make that commitment right now while together we stand and while we sing? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Now is the time to prepare, my friend. Make your soul spotless and free. Washed in the blood of the crucified one, he will your answer be. What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Levon, I'm going to ask you to come to the microphone. I, I evidently haven't made myself clear.